Hello, and welcome to the Current Science and Technology Podcast from the Museum of Science in Boston. I'm your host, Susan Heilman, and every week we bring you interviews with guest researchers and our museum staff covering science and technology in depth. I have with me Dr. Jeremy England, a biophysicist from MIT, who will be talking to us about his work looking at shape-shifting molecules. Hi, Dr. England. Hi there. So shape-shifting molecules, we're not talking about aliens that can change their shapes here, but more about molecules, they change their shape by themselves, or are you changing their shape? We're talking about particular molecules in the cell, in living things, where the way that they change their shapes is connected to how they function in the biological context. Specifically, we're talking about proteins. Proteins are these nanoscale small molecules that actually account for a large part of the dry weight of living things. They are a lot of what we're made of. And they are the molecular machines that are accomplishing all the different tasks in the cell that need to happen in order for the cell to function properly. And often the way that they do that is actually not by just having a particular shape, but by changing their shape. So the the classic view when you first learn about protein folding is that a protein is made out of a certain particular sequence of amino acids. And when you put that in the cellular context, it folds up into a particular shape, and that shape is what gives it its function. Because maybe it positions certain chemical groups exactly the right way in space to catalyze some reaction, or it makes a little pocket that can bind some molecule. So as an example of a protein, maybe something a lot of people have heard of, um, as hemoglobin, that mm-hmm. hemoglobin, doesn't it, it can bind oxygen in one shape, but then release oxygen in another shape? Is that mm-hmm. kind of the, the folding, the differences you're talking about? Yeah, so hemoglobin is a really classic example of how conformational change is linked to function in proteins. Hemoglobin tends to form these tetramers, which means that it's a group of four hemoglobin proteins, so four of them stick together in this arrangement whereby all the different changes in shapes of the four together, coupled together, can lead to a change in the tendency of the molecule to release or absorb oxygen. And so then that becomes in turn connected to its function in the blood, which carries oxygen around the body. So the way that that is going to happen is that it's gonna have to do with the forces in the environment around the protein and how they act on the protein in a concerted way. So it's very much linked to what gave the protein its structure in the first place. It has a particular structure from the amino acid sequence it's made out of, but the amino acid sequence doesn't just encode the structure, it encodes the tendency of that structure to fluctuate in certain very particular ways, where one part of the chain moves to the left, so to speak, and the other part of the chain at the same time will tend to move to the right. And it's these correlated motions that are gonna help us do a whole range of things in the cell that we couldn't do if every protein just remained static and maintained one single shape. So the amino acid sequence, the actual molecules themselves and what they're called, what they look like, that stays the same, Mm -hmm. but it's whether or not one is touching another or folded into another. So it's the three-dimensional shape of what it's going to look like, and that can actually be different. So what is it that's changing the shape? What are some of the outside influences that can cause it to look one way or the other? Mm -hmm. So this could happen for a lot of different reasons. So sometimes proteins change shape just because the environment around them has dramatically changed. So the simplest thing that you can do as an experiment at home to see that is to fry an egg. The serum in the egg uh, that surrounds the yolk is going to be full of proteins, right? Especially a particular protein called albumin. And you throw that in a frying pan and change the temperature and the shape a protein prefers to take depends on its temperature. So in this case, you're not doing it in any functional way unless you consider, you know, filling your belly a function. But what you're doing is you're heating the egg The protein changes shape, and that's why it goes from transparent to white, and now you have this denatured egg protein that you can eat. But if you're trying to understand the function in the biological context, then sometimes proteins change shape because there's the presence of some molecule that wasn't there before. One of the things that we've been circulating around is this term called allosteric. What allosteric refers to is the idea that at some distant site on a protein, you can get a change in shape that results from an event somewhere else in the protein. So a molecule binds to one part of the protein and you get a change in shape in some other part. So allosteric regulation, among other things, allows you to modulate gene transcription in response to your environment. And that's what helps living things work because living things don't just do one thing all the time. They're responsive. They process signals from their environment and transduce them into new behaviors. 
Also, in these biological systems, at least in relation to how a protein's folding, is there just a limited number, maybe a lot, but still a limited number, a finite number of conformational changes that it can go through? That's a really great question. And what it gets at, I think, is that whenever we talk about these things, we really have to speak in what we would call statistical terms. And the reason is that when you're talking about a protein sitting in the cell, it's sitting there at some temperature. And it's down at the nanoscale. And what that means is that it's constantly being bombarded by molecules that are moving fast enough to give it a kick and cause it to change its shape. So really, every protein is to some extent changing its shape all the time. But it doesn't sample all the shapes it could take equally because some of them have lower energies than others. And what temperature really ends up being at that level is a way of telling you how likely something is. The things that have lower energy are more likely than the things at higher energy at a given temperature. Because what temperature tells you is how much energy you basically have available for fluctuations. So in a given protein, you put it at some temperature in the cell, it's changing its shapes. There are going to be some shapes that will be very common and others that will essentially be so uncommon, astronomically uncommon, that you would never, ever expect to see it happen. The same way you would never expect to see all the molecules of air in the room collect in one corner and form a spontaneous vacuum so you can't breathe. So that's very comforting. <laughs> that's very unlikely to happen. Right. We don't have to worry about it. Everything in how proteins work is driven by the same kind of principles, that you have lots of things that are more likely to happen. And so when we talk about the particular shapes that are relevant to a protein's function, we usually have to make some choice about how to model it, where we assume particular sub-ensembles or subgroups of conformations are particularly important to some functional event. Now, when you talk about statistics, that implies that there could be some sort of mathematical equation, but are there too many variables, or can you boil this down to a few variables? Mm -hmm. So I think your wording is really perfect there because the same question could be asked of a pot of boiling water, right? There are lots of different molecules in a pot of water. And if you wanted to, you could get really bogged down worrying about, well, there's molecule one and it's over here and it's moving that way at this speed and there's molecule two, et cetera, and count them all up. But if you want to understand how much heat you have to put in the water to make it boil, that actually is a much simpler question. And the reason is that you end up being able to not worry about most things that could happen because they're very unlikely. So the law of large numbers, as it's called, is your friend in that case. <laughs> the statistical behavior of groupings of components where there are many of them is a very robust reproducible phenomenon. So water is always going to boil at the same temperature, even though any given one pot of water is going to have molecules doing one thing and in another pot of water they'll be doing slightly different things. But for our purposes, we can average over all the differences between them and we get the same result. So very similar kind of mathematics go into doing the kind of mathematical models that we work with in my research group, where we are, in a sense, trying to compute the statistical distribution of likely conformations for a protein. And because when we're talking even about a cell, we're talking about thousands of proteins or millions of proteins, then we're getting into a situation where their average behavior is going to be a very important thing and possibly the only important thing. Or even if not, we can even get a handle on some of the fluctuations about the average without needing to know all the details of how every single protein is arranged. That makes a lot of sense, actually, and it makes it a little bit simpler, yeah, than having to go through the millions and billions of different possibilities, but you get down to the average of where odds are it's going to be like this or odds are it's going to be like that. Mm -hmm. So when you're trying to see whether or not certain outside influences will affect the change, can you then add in that variable, change your model, and get an idea of the new shape of the protein? And this is all without actually seeing the protein. It's all done with modeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in our group, we work with very simple models that come from what is called statistical physics. So in some cases, when people study protein structure, they can make these very detailed models where they're trying to capture every possible force that happens between every one of the atoms in the system. And even then, they're always making approximations, but you can do that and go for a really high resolution picture. But what we're working with is simpler models where a few ingredients go in. But one of the ingredients that goes in is the protein sequence. Where we take the protein sequence, we assume this chain of amino acids is going to affect the protein structure in a particular way, driven by how one amino acid has some particular tendency to want to get buried in the core of the protein or exposed in the watery surface of the protein versus another amino acid. And that sort of tug of war among the different parts of the chain will lead to a particular shape. 
So if you want to understand, for example, why the protein would change shape if you mutate the sequence, that's something that we can deal with pretty well. You change the sequence, you just change an input to the model, and now you get different structural information out of the model and something different happens. And sometimes you see that it's a small something different, which is in some cases almost negligible, and in others you might see a larger difference. And on the other hand, sometimes the same perturbation could be very small in its outcome. So you've been speaking kind of in, in generality, saying, you know, you work with simple proteins. Can you give an example of one of the proteins you're working with and, and why that's important? Mm -hmm. So one of the proteins that we work on theoretically and also have an experimental collaboration to study is called VHL, or von Hippel-Lindau tumor suppressor. So it was a gene that was first discovered in connection to certain kinds of cancers. And what's interesting about VHL is that it's a protein that's capable of folding into a particular shape when it binds to what are called its cofactors or its partners. So other proteins, when they're present, provide a surface, and VHL sort of gloms onto that surface and folds into a very specific shape. But without those cofactors, VHL just stays disordered. And so we're now at the stage where what we want to do is use the model to predict mutations that will then lead to structural stabilization of VHL. And we're going to test that out experimentally. Wow. So that's really interesting, though, that you're also collaborating with um, an experimental group so that you can not only right do your predictions, see whether or not well your model says it should look like this and then you can actually see in the cell yeah i think that's extremely important especially in the case of biophysics and so i have a variety of experimental collaborations uh, the one i was just referring to is with a very good friend of mine first from college and then from graduate school dan haganovich he has a cell biology lab at hebrew university in jerusalem and he does live cell fluorescent microscopy so he studies protein folding in the cell and I study the physics of the folding, and together we come up with a lot of different experiments that are interesting to do together. Wow. Thank you, Dr. England, for joining me here today and telling us all about the generalities of protein folding and then some of the specific work you're doing. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. That's it for this week's show, but be sure to come back next time for more of the latest in science and technology. This podcast is a production of Current Science and Technology at the Museum of Science in Boston, part of the Boston community for over 175 years. For more information, visit our website at www.mos.org slash CST or email us at podcast at mos.org. Thanks for listening.